Hey friends, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about the anti-catabolic effects of ketones. We're going to review a little paper published by our friends Andrew Kutnick and Dom D'Agostino, who we've both had on the podcast before, as well as Brendan Egan. I, I've shared a lot of Brendan's work, so I want to thank you, Brendan, if you are watching or if you get this. Definitely follow him in his academic research because he talks a lot about muscle, uh, ketones, exercise, metabolism. I think he's in Ireland. And by the way, guys, I did review this very quickly on my YouTube channel on Sunday. It was informal. Part of the whiteboard is cut off, and that's the impetus to recreate this, and hopefully there's no issues. So I do want to thank you for commenting, because some people did comment on that and said, hey, Mike, I would like to understand this, but like, I can't see the whiteboard. So let's get into the studies and review what George Cahill talked a lot about. It will help you understand and conceptualize the potential reason teleologically as to why ketones may be anti-catabolic and muscle sparing. We're gonna get into the, the review here in a second. So this is gonna be glucose on this axis. These are arbitrary units, right? So this is gonna be the starvation response. So if you were to do a 48 hour fast, for example, the first roughly 24 hours, the, the glucose here is gonna come from glycogen. So stored glycogen in your muscle tissue, stored glycogen in your liver. And then after about between 24 or 30 hours, it depends on the individual, if they're low carb, high fat, uh, if they're keto, if they're not keto, what, if they're metabolically flexible, all that comes into play here. But uh, in, in this mark, between 20, 24 and 36 hours, studies show, so again, there's tissues in the body that are obligate glucose utilizers, the retina, the neuron, the red blood cells, and so forth. So we need glucose. Now, remember, part of this is GNG, gluconeogenesis. So the body is great at making glucose from anew, and that's why there's five different hormones, right? Adrenaline, noradrenaline, growth hormone, uh, you know, glucagon. There's all these hormones to raise glucose. Uh, and there's only one to lower it. Think about that. It's kind of interesting. Insulin. So anyway, uh, this is going to be a muscle belly. This is adipocytes here. So we can get gluconeogenic substrates from breaking down muscle, right? And so again, the reason why I'm talking to you about this is so that you can conceptualize and better understand the potential reason why intelligent design, evolution, natural selection, whatever you want to believe in as to how the body got created this way and, and how we are, this is how it, it happens, right? So muscle tissue releases glutamine, alanine, leucine, things like that, that are all gluconeogenic substrates. Fat tissue releases both free fatty acids and glycerol. Glycerol is kind of the backbone of the triacylglycerides, triglycerides that are stored in your adipose tissue or your adipocytes. Glycerol is a gluconeogenic substrate, as is lactate and pyruvate, right? So Cahill talks about this a lot. Remember, Don D'Agostino has learned a lot about the ketogenic diet and the starvation response from George Cahill, as has many others. Uh, I consider him kind of a father in this space, and he has some great papers. He talked about how, you know what, if the body couldn't make ketones, if hepatic ketogenesis didn't happen, then all of our muscle mass would have eventually be stripped away and humans and other animals would not be able to go with, for a long period of time without food because their muscle mass would be declining. So what kind of saves the body's ability to break down muscle tissue is the adaptability of the heart tissue, of the muscle tissue, and of the brain to utilize both ketones and fatty acids for fuel. And so here's kind of what's cool about when you burn body fat from fasting, from exercise, from eating a low carb ketogenic style diet, is you're releasing glycerol, which is a gluconeogenic substrate, and you're releasing free fatty acids, which go down. And I'm just gonna put um, KG for ketogenesis, for hepatic ketogenesis, the synthesis of ketones. So that's kind of the dual property of breaking body fat. And so that's why when we talk about being fat adapted or metabolically flexible, that's what people are talking about. So now that you have this in mind, again, the ability to synthesize and make ketones helps the body utilize ketones and fats as energy as opposed to constantly relying upon gluconeogenic substrates and tearing down muscle tissue. And that's why only in after 18, 15 days do you really see nitrogen loss being a major concern uh, in fasted subjects. So long story short, you know, this excellent review paper kind of highlighted two different studies wherein we know about you know the potential anti-catabolic effects of ketones one of them got blood ketone levels and i could be wrong i think it's uh two millimolar and then the other study got blood ketone levels to 3.5 millimolar so these are higher levels than you're going to get uh in you know just on a daily basis for most people if you're fat adapted if you exercise if you eat a clean diet um unless you're doing a lot of fasting all the time unless you're really, really overweight, 
Uh, most people are not gonna have blood BHB, and this is beta hydroxybutyrate, by the way. Um, and this is BHB. So long story short, what they found in, in these two different studies, this particular study I think was really interesting where uh, this Dr. Thomason et al, again, it's, it's in the review paper by uh, Kutnick et al. Um, what he found is that when subjects were fasted and they were given an LPS infusion, so LPS or lipopolysaccharide is essentially, I'm gonna draw a bracket here, it's also known as endo, uh, toxin. So long story short guys, just you need to understand what this is. Uh, I talked about this at length and this was basically the premise of a book that I wrote over five years ago now called Belly Fed Effect. Uh, endotoxin is this little fragment on gram-negative bacteria. Mm. Ooh, gram-negative bacteria, okay? So we all have about five grams of endotoxin in our GI tract at any given time. Uh, if we were to go under if we were to get stabbed, for example, unfortunately, if that were to ever happen to you, you get into a bad car accident, you lacerate your bowel, and endotoxin comes into your bloodstream, that's known as sepsis, and that could kill you. There's enough endotoxin in your gut right now to kill every single one of us, but the reason why we're not dying is because we have, most of us should have a good barrier between our intestinal tract and our body. Some of us don't. And this endotoxin gets into the body and it's very pro-inflammatory. So, so authors, researchers, scientists like to use endotoxin as a pro-inflammatory stimulus. Again, this is a way to really stimulate various pro-inflammatory signaling switches within the body and to raise cytokines like TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, interferon-gamma, interleukin-1-beta, like you know, all these pro-inflammatory signaling hubs get stimulated when our bodies are exposed to endotoxins. And so as a side note, there's this whole notion of uh, infect obesity, metabolic endotoxemia as a trigger uh, inducing insulin resistance. So we have talked with Alina Guggenheim and other people about immunometabolism. It's a conversation for another day, but just understand that the drivers of obesity and insulin resistance are not just macronutrient based. They can be inflammatory of, of inflammatory origin. So this Dr. Thomason, he's, he pronounces his name, I think it's like that, it's in the references of the study. He took healthy individuals, I think 10 subjects, gave, in, they were fasted, I believe injected locally or systemically, I didn't read the methodology, but he gave them a, a big bolus of, of uh, LPS endotoxin. Again, to, to really kind of kickstart inflammation and then he, in, he infused via IV, I believe, uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate until it got to 3.5 millimolar. And then it, what they showed was a, a dramatic decrease in uh, one of the markers, I think they looked at muscle protein synthesis um, and, and muscle util, uh, breakdown was DL phenylalanine turnover, I believe was one. One of these was leucine oxidation. The other, the other one was uh, DL phenylalanine breakdown. Uh, but long story short, what they found was that the, the, when ketones were this high, which is fairly high, you would get this by taking exogenous ketones, namely, um, that, that the, the inflammation-induced cachectic response was mitigated, right? So does that make sense? So it's not that, uh, that beta-hydroxybutyrate directly stimulated muscle protein synthesis per se, but the, but the situation was that it attenuated the inflammation-induced loss or breakdown of muscle tissue. And so I think that's the important thing to keep in mind. And Stuart Phillips and Dom D'Agostino, because I did share this on my uh, Twitter three weeks ago or so, uh, Stuart Phillips jumped in and he had a good point. He said, you know, look, as long as you lift weights, you don't need to worry about these high millimolar levels of, of ketones because lifting weights is inherently anabolic and pro-anabolic. And great point, can't argue with that at all. And, and I respect Stuart a lot. And Dom said, yeah, well, I understand what you're saying, Stuart, but the, the context and the application of these two different studies that found that but around 2 millimolar and 3.5 millimolar of beta-hydroxybutyrate can be used in situations where people don't have access to a gym, they're bedridden, post-surgical procedures, you know, they have issues along those lines. And so this would be the context where potentially IV or exogenous ketones could be helpful. So that's the, the circumstances. And this was uh, the other study, let me, by uh, Nair et al., and so what they found is that uh, this decreased leucine oxidation. So remember, leucine is one of the branched chain amino acids. So just for simplistic purposes, uh, although it is just specifically leucine, uh, this decreased leucine oxidation and it increased um, MPS by 10%. So uh, 
that was what this study had shown. And again, I didn't look at the methodology of this. I haven't been to my medical school library to, to download the full text papers of these. So I'm just relying upon what was conveyed in the peer reviewed review, uh, again, by Kutnik et al. So I think this is interesting, something to keep in mind. Uh, again, keep what Stuart Phillips said in context, right? So for most people, driving that stimulus through exercise is gonna be how you're gonna offset some of the catabolic messages that inflammatory signals like lipopolysaccharide could offer in the body. But for those of us that are gonna have a, a, you know, a planned surgical procedure or if we get in a major accident, we don't wanna lose muscle mass, we can consider supplementing with BCAs and whey protein and all that. And that's one side to hopefully stimulate MPS, but we can also consider taking potentially exogenous ketones to mitigate the inflammation-induced loss of, of muscle and breakdown. So hopefully, and, and there's a great diagram and chart. So definitely, if, if you want to share this with someone that's interested, um, you know, I'll put the link to the Twitter feed below, but this is a really cool picture to kind of convey what's going on here. So I want to thank Andrew, I want to thank Brendan, I want to thank Dom for publishing this paper. I think it's really unique, something that we're going to be talking a little bit more about uh, in the coming days and weeks. And if you like this video, you can always hit that like button. Leave me a comment. I like to hear what you guys and gals think. And if you want to learn a little bit more about intermittent fasting and the you know kind of gluconeogenic and different substrates, the body com has a compensatory way to, to shift macronutrients when you're fasting, I have another video that I'll link right here. It's all about intermittent fasting that was streamed live but you could see the whole um, whole whiteboard. So very grateful that you guys commented. I listened to your comments, and so I'm glad you guys were like, dude, that first live video that you made sucked, so I made another one. Hopefully this one was a little bit better, and hopefully you enjoyed this video, and if you did, uh, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, that way you get updated when we launch new videos like this, and we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Have a good one.